The 2021 legislative session is beginning to kick into high gear, and State Senator Brian Williams of University City is hoping to make his mark with legislation overhauling policing practices. Williams joins us next on the latest episode of Politically Speaking to break down his bill and some of the other issues he may be dealing with in the General Assembly's upper chamber. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. It's a little complicated in Bolivar because there is a Parsons family there. But we also knew that it was important to make sure that that we got to where we needed to go. You know if you walk in a room and you're getting ready to make a decision and everybody in the room looks like you, you need to stop. And right now what happens in the United States Senate is as critical as anywhere else in the country. I really want the state to succeed. We want everybody to uh, know that we're all working together. I just worked hard to try to build my name where I didn't have the money. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent, Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me is St. Louis Public Radio State House reporter, Jacqueline Driscoll. And our special guest today, he is the state senator for Missouri's 14th district. Brian Williams. Thank you very much, Senator, for joining us on the show. We have a lot to talk about, but I want to spend the first part of the show talking about a bill that you're sponsoring, overhauling police practices. It seems to have a lot of momentum in the legislature right now, and I want you to take a few minutes to talk about what's in it and why you're filing it. Yeah, absolutely. First, again, uh, thank you and uh, Jacqueline for having me on. It's always good to be on Politically Speaking. Uh, You know, with Senate Bill 60, uh, it's a um, comprehensive police reform bill, which uh, focuses on uh, much needed police reforms in Missouri, um, like banning chokeholds, punishing uh, sexual misconduct of officers, and making sure that bad officers are not allowed to avoid accountability for their actions by hopping around from department to department. You know, I think it's really important that um, we focus on Missouri being a leader in improving police and community relations. So I think these are some really um, good common sense reforms. Senator, you you briefly touched on it there, but I wanted to see if you could go a little bit further um, in explaining what you mean when you say it stops officers from hopping around from department to department. And listening listening to some of the details in the committee hearings, um, I thought that piece was particularly interesting and something that I think our listeners would also find pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I represent a Senate district that has 35 municipalities and um, several of those municipalities have police departments. And we've seen um, historically that um, police officers tend to uh, leave one department and go to another. And it's not always um, at the expense of them doing a good job. So basically what Senate Bill 60 will do is it would provide a level of immunity to uh, police chiefs and and, and officers to be able to disclose um, misconduct of of officers within the police department. Uh, Today, Uh, If someone was to inquire about a police officer who may have been under investigation or potentially resigned before that investigation was uh, concluded, they would really have to really be brief and state maybe their their start date and their end date. So what this does is it really gives uh, a a really sense of security to good police officers to really disclose uh, misconduct. So similar to a mandated reporter in a sense. I know when you first introduced your bill, there were other things in it, including trying to curtail no-knock warrants, among other things. Why did those items not make it into the bill that was going through the, the committee it was in? Yeah, so we've we've been working uh, on this bill for uh, the past nine months and um, meeting consistently with law enforcement. I've traveled throughout the entire state of Missouri. Uh, talking to uh, activists, uh, members of law enforcement, um, ACLU, uh, NAACP. We've been places like Springfield, um, Columbia, uh, clearly Jefferson City, Kansas City, and of course uh, here in St. Louis. And you know, we found that a lot of these reforms um, cause you know some law enforcement members heartburn. And you know, we want to be able to to put reforms in place and and hopefully. Uh, law enforcement see over time that these reforms are, are building trust 
that we can actually go back and address things like no-knock arrest warrants. But I also want to add that no-knock arrest warrants is not solely uh, law enforcement. It does involve the courts. And um, as we saw, um, it was an issue that was very, very important to me. And I pushed um, really hard for it because right in St. Louis County, uh, where I, I represent and live, there was a woman who dog was uh, shot and killed due to a no-knock arrest warrant for an unpaid utility bill. So this is a really serious reform, but I, I you know, I understand how, how this process works. And, you know, it's really important that we move in the direction of, of as many reforms as possible, even if it's at the expense of not getting every single one we want. After the, the death of George Floyd and the national protests um, demanding police accountability, I, I tend to think that the tide is kind of on the side of leaning towards police reform. Um, I, I know that Missouri is very conservative. We have a governor who is a former sheriff and, and very heavily supports law enforcement. But do you think your bill right now goes far enough? Does this do enough to help build more trust between black and brown people and, and law enforcement? I, I, in listening to the committee hearing, I believe it was the ACLU or the NAACP obviously spoke in favor of this bill, but called it a, a starting point, something that they want to build off of. Um, so, so what do you hope to see eventually happen? No, you know, when I came into the Senate, um, I was the first black man to serve in that chamber in two decades. So as a senator, you know, it's my job to just bring my experiences and, and, and my insights to the table to, to hopefully achieve change for the people uh, I serve and, and everyone throughout this entire state. So, you know, I, I made, you know, police reform one of my top priorities. And, you know, I, I understand that, you know, it requires building bipartisan support for this legislation in a um, heavily Republican legislature. So I do believe this is a very strong starting point. I think that it, it does a couple things. Not only does it create a, a conversation at the state level around why it's important to build uh, trust in the community and, and, and ensure that police accountability and public safety is at the foundation of the conversation, but it also, in my opinion, uh, applies pressure to local government to take a more serious look at their police departments. Uh, whether it's in St. Louis or Kansas City. And I've had um, local leaders reach out to me wanting to do resolutions in support of, of my bill, uh, wanting to uh, learn more and figure out what they can do at the local level to ensure that these reforms uh, not only are enforced uh, locally, but how they can do more as well. So I, I think this creates a, a, an opportunity for Missouri to be on the right side of this issue. So uh, there was a development with your bill where it is being combined with another bill sponsored by Senator Tony Luchtemeyer, who for full disclosure, and I disclose this often, he's been a friend of mine for 14 or 15 years, and I don't cover him because of that. I believe part of your bill is being combined with another bill to remove the residency requirement for Kansas City Police Department. Talk a little bit about why you think that may be necessary to get the elements of your bill across the finish line? Well, you know, over the summer, um, the governor demanded legislation on St. Louis p police residency, and he got his bill without touching police reform. Um, I also urged the governor during the special session to uh, take up police reform as a conversation uh, during that session, and uh, he did not. He didn't extend the call. Uh, so we cannot allow that to happen again. So if the Republican-led legislature wants to remove um, Kansas City residency, they will find a way. But I'll also make sure police reform is part of the mix. So, you know, clearly uh, Kansas City area lawmakers are going to um, have to figure out what residency looks like on their end. And they absolutely should. But my focus right now is 100 percent police reform, um, you know, like banning chokeholds and, and making sure that uh, we stay focused on protecting Black lives in this state. I feel like this is a, a good opportunity to ask you about that residency requirement piece specifically in Kansas City. Um, I know that there are some local individuals who are opposed to the idea, just as, as we saw in St. Louis, but we also saw in St. Louis a mayor and a police chief that heavily backed that uh, specific proposal. So overall, since you represent the area, I mean, how how well will residency requirements be received or not? 
if it does make it across the finish line? Well, um, I, I don't represent Kansas City, uh, but you know that's that's something that we'll have to look at the bill and 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 see what the details of it is uh, when it came to St. Louis residency. Um, you know, I, I deferred to um, the voters because it was on the ballot uh, that November and, and I, I voted no. But, you know, at the same time, you know, we worked very hard um, to get a, a three year sunset on it. And I think there's a, a lot of uh, creative ways that the legislature could could work to um, work through this this bill. But we have to be clear about one thing. And, and this is police reform um, during a special session. Um, Republicans uh, wanted to push residency. They got it. We did not get anything in return. And uh, I refused to um, allow that to happen this time around. Um, I asked the legislature to focus on police reforms during the special session. Um, they said it would be best to take it up uh, in January with the new uh, legislation. I'm sorry, new legislature. And that's what we're doing now. And uh, right now, police reform is my primary focus. I think um, we need to uh, ban choke codes in Missouri. We need to make sure that police officers are held accountable and we need to build a trust if we want there to be uh, police, not only police accountability, but drive down crime in uh, communities like St. Louis and Kansas City. So obviously pre- tra- predicting the trajectory of legislation is kind of a difficult thing to do in the Missouri legislature. As I mentioned on the outset, it does seem like the pieces are there to get this passed, which would probably be some of the most significant police overhaul since Michael Brown's shooting death in 2014. Uh, how do we? How do you get this across the finish line? Because there have been a lot of people that have put forth ideas like yours over the last six or seven years, and they never seem to make it, and it never seems to be a priority for the Missouri legislature. What What are you going to do to change that trajectory for 2021? Well, you know, we just have to work at it. You know, this is the first time the legislature has taken up uh, sweeping police reforms. I mean, probably ever. Um, You know, Jason, you're more of a historian in that capacity. But, you know, to think that this bill has gotten a hearing, this bill will will go before the body. There has not been a a piece of legislation at the state level or probably even locally that has um, gotten this far and, and will continue to push. And this is just a testament to how hard we've, we've been working on it. Um, I've dedicated the past year uh, talking to law enforcement, um, talking with activists, meeting with uh, social justice groups and, and crafting a bill that's gonna not only hold police um, officers accountable, but build a trust between police officers in the community. And, you know, I, I think about George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, Michael Brown, who, uh, who was um, shot and killed in, in Ferguson, where I represent and grew up. Um, I, I'm committed to this issue and, and I'm going to do everything I can to uh, ensure that Missouri's on the right side. of it. Now, when when your bill was getting coverage both here and nationally, there was another bill sponsored by Senator Rick Bratton. And I'm, I'm reading this right now that would have actually which actually allowed drivers to use deadly force against protesters in certain instances. To be clear to our listeners, these are two completely separate bills, and I, I have no doubt that Senator Williams does not support Senator Bratton's bill. My question, though, is, is it are you fearful that what you and Senator Luke DeMeyer are trying to do is going to get intertwined with the legislation I just mentioned, and that's going to cause a whole lot of complications toward getting anything past the finish line? Well, I've made it very clear that um, I think it's an awful bill. Um, I think there's too much violence in our society already. There's too much violence in in our political rhetoric. And that bill allows people to kill protesters with their car. It's another example of uh, political extremism, you know, uh, people trying to rile up their base to win some votes. And we saw that happen in Washington, D.C. on January 6th with Senator Josh Hawley. So um, as long as I'm in the Senate, we will not pass laws legalizing the murder of people exercising their constitutional rights. And um, my bill is is no way affiliated with uh, Senate Bill 66 and in respect to, to Senator Bratton. Um, I, I don't think his bill would move our state in the right direction. We'll be right back after this quick break with Senator Brian Williams of University City. And we're back on Politically Speaking with 
uh, State Senator Brian Williams. He is a Democrat from University City. So I want to spend the second part of the show talking about the many other issues that you're going to confront. Uh, I would cost, I would classify 2020 as a very strange legislative session because it was the uh, onset of, of COVID. But it seems this session is also kind of in flux because the virus is still around. Legislators are either getting exposed to the virus or getting the virus. What is this session like? It still seems pretty strange and unusual. Yeah, it's been a very, I mean, just rough time. I mean, to think that we have um, roughly 200 um, legislators in a building, and that's that's not counting staff and, and other folks. I mean, it's, it's a very, very concerning environment. But, you know, um, there's folks that get up every day and, and they work on the front line as healthcare professionals. They, they educate our, our, our children and they, they I mean, they, they make sure that the public get access to, to information like you guys do every day. And, and that's a commitment that I'm willing to make and, and show up every day. You know, since I've been in the legislature, um, I'm very proud to have never missed a day of session and have never missed a vote in the, in the almost three sessions I've been there. So I'm, I'm committed to, to that process. And, you know, clearly we do everything we possibly can. Um, we wear masks. Um, we we um, really stress our, our, our colleagues on the other side to wear masks. And uh, I think with the uptick in, in cases and, and the, the number of deaths that's happening uh, throughout the state and not just St. Louis and Kansas City, I think folks are realizing this virus is real. And I'm hoping that we can roll out a, a strong vaccination uh, program at some point and and continue to to keep an uptick in testing. But until then, just you know, we try best to protect ourselves. I want to I want to ask a bit about some legislation that's moving. But I also have to ask since um, I haven't really spoken to a lot of senators about the fact that the state of the state was held in the Senate chamber. I thought it was so weird. Jason was there and we were just like, this is such a weird day. Being a senator, normally you're in the House chamber. Um, what was that like to have the governor come in to the Senate chamber, giving the state of the state to a very small crowd? Well, full disclosure, um, we it was a very last minute thing. So the Senate did not find out uh, that there was going to be a change in the state of state address by the governor until the day of. And, and really, I didn't notice until I started really seeing uh, media go around. And then, I, you know, the governor's office did uh, notify my office that there was going to be some, some potential changes. And, um, you know, I, I did not attend the state of state. And, and it wasn't um, for any other reason but the fact that I, I really believe we need to practice social distancing. I think we need to really uh, do everything we can to, to avoid large crowds. And unfortunately, you know, it, it was an even smaller chamber and, and more people than usual uh, in there. So, you know, I, I did listen to the governor's remarks, but I, I listened from my office. On, on the issue of uh, police reform, it's not directly related to police reform, but it deals with law enforcement. The House just on Thursday passed uh, SEPA or the Second Amendment Preservation Act, which I know um, just recently happened, but it's not a new bill either. This is something that's uh, continuously come up. It almost got through the legislature back when uh, uh, Nixon was governor and then he vetoed it. Um, but in some of my conversations, just having off offline on, on background with some representatives in the House, some of the staff, I'm told even some Republicans would like to see the Senate clean up some of the language, particularly when it comes to joint task forces, because what this bill would do, um, it essentially does not allow any local or state law enforcement to enforce federal gun laws. Um, so I know it's still early and this, but um, as now that it moves over to the Senate, what are some of your concerns or some changes you would like to see um, as this bill comes over to your chamber? Yeah, absolutely. I, I serve on the, the Transportation Committee, which also oversees public safety uh, as well. So most of those those gun bills come through that that committee. And, you know, every year I've been in the Senate, I've been opposed to that bill. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a very concerning bill. And to think that law enforcement has acknowledged that this bill would not only make their job more difficult, 
but it would also put them in a situation to, to really walk into even more dangerous situations. Um, as even with police reform, you know, I've made it very clear that we want to protect police officers uh, just as, as, as much as we want to ensure that the, the public is safe and, and have trust. So this bill is not going to help police reform. It's not going to help anyone. It's going to make job, um, law enforcement's job harder. So I'm, I'm strongly opposed to it. And uh, I'll do everything I can. And I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be probably a lot of folks that are advocating against this bill. And then and then to take it even further, I don't think this bill would even be deemed constitutional. They, they had that conversation in the House, too. We heard a lot. Um, they had some very robust discussions. Um, but because you do work closely with Republican leadership in the Senate, I'm not sure that you've had conversations with them. But in the House, this bill passed strictly on party lines. There's no... Democrat support, no Republicans voted no. I mean, do you see that happening in the Senate, which Democrats have a super minority in both chambers? Um, so it may be hard to, you know, make changes or to stop this bill. Obviously, you have the filibuster in your favor in the Senate, but I mean, how do how do you have those conversations moving forward? Well, if you know, clearly, if if the Republicans look to move forward on this bill. Uh, I can tell you one thing, our caucus, uh, small but mighty, have, have been able to really uh, keep bad things from happening in this state. So, I mean, we'll, we'll do what we have to do to prevent it from going into law. But as of today, it, it, it's a non-starter in the Senate. And, you know, clearly that can change. So hopefully it, it doesn't come up. But if it does, um, we'll be prepared to, to do everything we can to keep it from going into law. You know, to, to piggyback on the point uh, that Jacqueline alluded to, um, I was covering the legislature when this bill came up before, and there was a Democratic governor who vetoed it, and the veto was actually sustained because Senators Ron Richard and Tom Dempsey voted to sustain the veto. Uh, it also helped that Chris Coster spoke out against the bill uh, when he was attorney general, so much so that the sponsor at the time, Brian Nieves, called Coster both a political master and a political monster. Uh, which is one of the better quotes I've heard from former Senator Nevis. But here's the thing, and I think Jacqueline alluded to this, there's no Democratic governor to veto this. And if this passes by a simple majority, I think you're, the best hope for people that don't like this bill is either for Parson to veto it or for the courts to strike it down. So how does that kind of change the the calculus among among some of your colleagues of both parties about how, where this bill goes yeah well i mean it's, it's going to be interesting to see but i would i would like to think as the governor uh being former law enforcement he'll understand firsthand that this is only going to create a far more uh, dangerous environment for law enforcement and and any member uh, of the body uh, especially the republican party who supports law enforcement should never wish to put uh any member of law enforcement in a potentially dangerous uh position but also for me um, I don't think we should be promoting um, really putting uh, any laws in place that's going to promote um, an opportunity for gun violence. And, you know, I've had this conversation with Moms Demand, who I, I have uh, support strongly uh, about these issues. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's really a crazy bill. And, you know, I, I can't re really even think of a, uh, a nice way to say it. I mean, I'm, I'm strongly against it. And I'll I'll be willing to filibuster or do whatever we can to make sure it doesn't go into law because it's just terrible. Before Jason hops in with probably another topic, I also think it's important to note because, because it wasn't discussed on the House floor yesterday. There were a lot of things that Democrats spoke out against, particularly background checks are federal law. So that wouldn't you know be able to be enforced by local law enforcement or uh, keeping hands out, keeping guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. That's federal law. Um, police would not be able to enforce that. But also there um, was no uh, fiscal note. A lot of it was very abstract. We don't know how much it's going to cost. And also in speaking with an attorney um, about this particular issue, there is the chance that the federal gov government could essentially stop giving the state uh, their funding as well if the state does pass this law. So I just thought that was important to add to since uh, it wasn't discussed on the House floor. So let's do some quick hits on some issues that uh, probably deserve more exploration, but unfortunately we don't have an unlimited amount of time. Medicaid expansion will be coming down the pike, and 
Do you expect this to be contentious or do you think the fact that essentially the state's portion is going to be paid for with an enhanced Medicaid reimbursement takes a lot of the wind out of the sails of any controversy over this? Yeah, I do agree with that, Jason. But also, you know, the governor did state in his state of state address that um, that he would uh, uphold really the will of, of the people, uh, which is to uh, fully fund uh, Medicaid expansion. I serve on the Senate Appropriations Committee, so I'm committed to doing everything that uh, we possibly can as a committee to uh, ensure that we we fully fund it. Uh, it needs to be funded, and I and I think it'll be a game changer long term for the state of Missouri. And and I think all the naysayers who were uh, strongly opposed to Medicaid expansion would would see the benefits and realize that this was uh, something that was. Uh, very fortunate to happen in the state. No excuse absentee voting. Do you think that it could actually pass this year on a permanent basis, or do you think it's going to be bogged down with photo ID or getting rid of the presidential primary or other issues that are going to elicit a lot of controversy? Yeah, I think I think uh, it should happen. But, you know, I'll, I'll know something that's really interesting. Um, newly elected Senator Elaine Gannon um, in Jefferson County she actually filed a bill addressing uh, no excuse absentee voting. So, I mean, clearly there's there's bipartisan support for this. So it could potentially in the Senate uh, go somewhere possibly. But as stated before, you know, we went through quite a, a, a complicated process during the um, during the, the last session around it with uh, photo ID provisions that we were fortunate to get out. But we still ended up with a notary requirement. So. I think there always will still be some level of what I would consider red tape or a barrier, uh, which should never exist with voting uh, involved. And, and, you know, that's just been pretty much historical when it comes to voting in the legislature. Something I also spoke to you about earlier this this year, this session, um, was about the overpayments for people who filed unemployment during uh, the height of the coronavirus. We saw... Um, this past week that uh, the House held a special committee to hear uh, directly from the department. Um, the director kind of doubled down saying that the department does need to collect those back payments. They are, they'll offer payment plans. We also heard from the governor saying that uh, people need to pay that money back if they weren't um, supposed to be receiving that money. This is something that I talked to you about in terms of, you know, a lot of this money has already been spent by uh, several of the people who received that money. So your comments on that. Yeah. And, you know, as, as I told you before, Jacqueline, you know, if the state overpaid someone, that's on the state, not on the individual. You know, I was raised by a single mom, so I know how difficult it is to survive, let alone have the state make an error and then hold that person accountable is, is in my opinion, unfair. And we're working with the Department of Labor to try to resolve it. Uh, I'm very disappointed that um, there's there's members of the General Assembly that think that we should be uh, making uh, things harder for for folks that are struggling through unemployment during a pandemic. Um, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. And, and I, I think we need to be on the side of of the folks that are impacted and not um, not enhancing the state to, to not take ownership for its mistakes. I would be remiss if I didn't ask about an effort to make it a lot more difficult for local counties to enact health ordinances um, in relation to COVID-19. I think a lot of this, especially the, the people from St. Louis County who are pushing this, are really, really upset with County Executive Sam Page over how he's handled the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that there are a lot of Democrats, many of whom are in your district, who aren't happy with him either. But without going down the rabbit hole of St. Louis County politics, because it is a deep, deep rabbit hole, what's going to be your mindset when that when those bills inevitably come up for Senate debate? Well, you know, one, I, I think that it's, it's really important that there needs to be a, a, a true partnership between the state and local government. And, you know, and, and I don't think it sets good precedent for us to um, pretty much, I guess, ignore uh, what local government is doing when it comes to, you know, whether it's a health department or, or it's, uh, it's criminal justice uh, system process, it, it doesn't matter. So, you know, I think there needs to be a partnership and that partnership means enabling each level of government to, to do its job where it can. 
So, you know, clearly I, I support uh, local control and, and I hope that we can work it out. Uh, the last topic I want to ask is COVID-19 liability, which actually I think came through the Senate. And uh, when I say came through the Senate, squeaked out of the Senate after what, like 15, 16 hours of debate or something ridiculous like that? Yeah, we um, we ended up uh, finishing up about 5.30 a.m. So anybody that wonders whether or not uh, Missouri uh, state senators work a lot, we do. Uh, that was a I think it was a 16, 17 hour filibuster um, dealing with COVID liability. So the interesting thing about that was it was both parties that were speaking out against it for various reasons. I think Jacqueline and I have said on previous shows that I, I think we're both guessing there's going to be something that goes to the governor's desk because it does seem like this is something all chambers and the executive branch agree with. Um, are you expecting that you've seen the last of COVID-19 liability in the Senate? Do you think the House is going to make changes and you're going to have like a 30 hour filibuster before the end of session? Well, I hope not. But, uh, you know, there's some there's some reasonable things in, in that bill. You know, protecting job creators is good. Um, helping small businesses um, have access um, or avoid business interruption insurance is good. However, limiting someone's right um, to a trial by jury is wrong. So, you know, we should be, you know, protecting, you know, crooks who sell faulty equipment to first responders is wrong or uh, things like letting nursing homes off the hook when they neglect or, or harm residents during a pandemic clearly is also wrong. So, you know, in a, in a perfect world, uh, I could vote for just the good parts of a bill and, and vote against the bad parts. And but unfortunately, the Senate just doesn't work like that. So I'm still reviewing the latest version. And, and if there's more. Uh, bad than good, I'll, I'll vote against it. If only you could have line item veto power over bills that you that you uh, vote on, I think that, uh, well, you would, you would have to vote a lot more. So I'm not sure that you would really want that power. But on that note, Senator, thank you so much for joining us on Politically Speaking. For all of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. Jacqueline, how can people follow you on Twitter? Driscoll NPR. And Senator, how can people follow you on Twitter or any other parts of the World Wide Web? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Brian Williams, M-O, and that M-O is for Missouri. And I'm also on Facebook, and that's Brian Williams for Missouri. Thank you very much. And until next time, so long. 